Firstly, I'd like to um, introduce David Lilly. He'll be speaking first. He is the Senior Manager New South Wales at United Way Australia, and he's going to tell you all about the Hive at Mount Druitt. That's a, a real-world social lag that's been running for a couple of years. So look, just a quick overview of where I'm going to go. Uh, development of the Hive, I'll tell you about the initiative that I've been working on, where it comes from, who's been involved, where we're up to. Our five-year strategy, which is a fairly recent document and sort of resource kit that I'll explain a little bit, and the influence of the Hive within the organisation that I work for, United Way Australia. So development of the Hive and how we got it kicking along, it goes back to about 2013 where these three organisations, the 1020 Foundation based in Melbourne, uh, United Way Australia where I work, and New South Wales Family and Community Services were talking about what was sort of thought to be a new approach in the social space called collective impact. And they were thinking, where could we run a collective impact project in Australia? And New South Wales Family and Community Services basically said, look, we've got this place now, Jewel. It's the most difficult sort of area in the state when it comes to child protection, when it comes to public housing and other things. Let's try and put a collective impact or a collaborative project there. And then I sort of jumped in as the bunny who uh, had to try and get a project together. My brief was basically, in the first instance, go out and talk to people, find out what's going on in Mount Druitt, find out where different stakeholders are at, uh, in terms of government agencies, community service providers, community members, and get a bit of a gauge on whether we think we could develop a collaborative project, and particularly to help children, although at the beginning it was really about testing a model, uh, more so than a particular cohort of people. The first thing that I did that was organised for me was go out and meet with a, a group of largely single mums. There were about 10 or 12 people. I think there was one dad and the rest were mums. And I sat down with them to have a bit of a chat about their lives in Mount Druitt, what they were like, uh, their children's experience, and also their experience of the service system. And the way it worked was basically I showed up and said, Hi, I'm David. Really like to do something for the families in Mount Druitt really want to understand from you what goes on in this place. I've got an audio recorder, do you mind if I put that in the middle and you sort of tell me your experience? And that was about as much as I did. One of the responses was from someone I'll call Amanda and her response was essentially, uh, essentially this. She said, look, I've, I've got a child who's got additional needs. I've struggled a lot. I've tried to get help for her and I couldn't get it. You know, I've gone to various organisations, they haven't responded, my child hasn't fit their criteria, I didn't know what to do. One day I had a, a social service provider come and knock on my door and said, look, we're, we're new in the area, we're starting a new program, do you have kids? And she said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And I've got this daughter and she's got some needs. I said, oh, sorry, look, she's a bit too old, that's not really in the groups that we're funded for. Literally four or five days later, another service provider came and did the same thing. So essentially it was, there'd been a state government um, funding round, new service providers had been awarded contracts and they were looking for clients. So she had two people sort of reject that. She tried to talk to her child's school and again, they weren't particularly interested. She was then the, uh, the recipient of a, a fax knock on the door, family and community services saying, there's been a child protection notification, we believe you're abusing your child and you're gonna have to go through an investigation. The child was removed from her and placed with her, with her parents, with the child's grandparents, while she went through a couple of months of child protection <coughs> investigation. At the end of it, um, Family and Community Services said, look, we're satisfied that you haven't abused your child, but clearly you do need some help. We want to plug you into a service, and then they connected her to the service that she needs. And her statement really clearly to me and to the group was, yeah, how can that be the way the system works? I tried, I asked for help again and again, I didn't get it. I went through this horrible experience, my child went through this experience. Oh, and lo and behold, someone gives me what I need. So that became a sort of a symbol really from my first week on the job, that's what we were trying to solve. How do you try and get the service system to work differently in Mount Druitt? Very quick snapshot. Um, I won't go through all of this in detail. Some stats about Mount Druitt. Three in 10 children are developmentally vulnerable when they start school. Um, only 2% of the adult population has a tertiary qualification. That's not from people leaving school now, but across the adult population. They were the stats about five years ago. 
Um, only one in, one in five children was, well, sorry, one in five adults had completed high school as a child. Um, domestic violence rates four times higher than, than a lot of Sydney. In some suburbs, that's worse. It's like eight times higher. Um, high unemployed population, that again is for the whole Mount Druitt area. There are pockets of Mount Druitt where very few people work. Um, often they don't show up as being unemployed because they're on single parent payments and, and other things. Skim through quickly. So the work that we wanted to do, um, we don't really use the word or the language of social labs, but our lab, we wanted to look at strengths-based community work. How do we go in and value community members in Mount Druid? How do we understand their stories? How do we work with them to understand what might need to change and how it might need to change? Co-design. Um, how do we use you know, different methods and mechanisms for bringing different people together to design change? And collective impact, which I've sort of highlighted on the left side, so, sorry, your right side, uh, the approach that I was talking about earlier that came from the US around how, what are the key factors involved in making fundamental social change when you're in a complex environment? It's about identifying a common agenda, coming up with shared measures that you can all use, uh, mutually reinforcing activities rather than disparate, disconnected activities, continuous <coughs> communication and backbone support. So the work we do at The Hive, we call ourselves a backbone provider, which basically means we provide infrastructure for collaboration. We don't deliver services to children or families. <coughs> Excuse me. We're there to try and knit things together, to try and design different ways of working, different ways for the system and different sort of ways for community to, to collaborate. Our approach in a nutshell is, there's a bit of a story behind this and I might be able to tell it later, but in terms of our B theme, is what we want to do is have these small events, which is just a symbol for saying we want to bring different people together to identify what issues we want to work on uh, and who needs to work on them. So sort of fairly large gatherings of people where you, you work out priorities and high level sort of plans together. Incubation, where we then take those priorities and find different ways of working to try and solve the issues that we've identified. And as we sort of incubate new, new responses at a local level, finding ways to scale them, to implement them across Mount Druitt and hopefully across a broader area. So a very ba basic innovation cycle. Uh, we found fairly quickly that talking about innovation in Mount Druitt wasn't necessarily the best idea. But this analogy seems to work really well. People people sort of resonate with, with the message there. Key event that we had um, going back about 18 months now, our first swarm event where we brought together 74 odd people, um, spent two days together. So they were community members, people from business, people from government, people from social service organisations, <laughs> to try and figure out where we would start our work. Basically what we agreed was that we did want to do something specifically around children. We figured that we couldn't try and tackle everything at once. There are probably about, I think it's about 7,000 children, naught to five in Mount Druitt. There are 18 primary schools. And if you add them all up, literally a couple of hundred service providers. So we wanted to start something that was quite small and contained and then try and grow it over time. So what we decided was that we would work in the sort of pre-birth to five years old space for five years. And if we can get some different things to happen in that space, then we'll go along the continuum and look at the older age groups. And also paying attention to key transition points that you can see there along the top. This broadly <coughs> is a way of us trying to communicate to people how we work. The biggest problem that we see in Mount Druitt is people who just want to offer the same old solutions grab a policy from another state, grab something that was done 10 years ago, just continue to do the same thing that individual organisations have already been doing. So we started to talk about you know, what would happen if we combine baseline data, you know, we quantify the issues, we look at leading practice, we look at research, but then we start to mix it up with lessons from other settings. So that idea, one of them is we're trying to figure out how to get more kids into preschool. So we don't just look at preschool, we go, okay, there are sporting teams, how do they attract kids into the local soccer club? And what can we learn from that around how you, how you attract people and how you integrate them in? Um, local knowledge, really important. You know, we find ways, whether that's in collective meetings or whether they're separate sessions, finding ways of asking community what's going on and what would work for them, what meaningful change would look like. 
um, and diverse perspectives. So again, that idea of the incubation lab, where you're bringing really different people together to try and try and identify a different solution. And then once we find it, testing it, improving it, and scaling it. So what we ended up with was this thing called the Hive, a project that we talked about as having a place to come together. So we're based in a community centre that we call the Hive, a process for working collaboratively, that basic innovation cycle, a network of people from all sectors, and a team or a backbone to coordinate the work. And we always put this one last because we found that when we talk to people about what we do, they Im immediately look to the Hive team as the people who will solve all of the problems. Mm. And obviously that's not the intent. We're there to try and facilitate other people doing things differently. So the one that we really emphasise is uh, a network of people from all sectors and people who need to take collective responsibility for change. So after all of that, we then tried to get cracking on some concrete sort of issues and found that we were butting up against some sort of some different priorities. So we have an ambassador group, what was called a governance group, um, that sort of oversees our work. And we found that there were really different expectations from different stakeholders as to what we do. So we ended up defining it as, as these four core sort of pieces of work. Suburb work, where we go in and talk to community members. Postcode work, that's more about bringing service providers and others together to identify solutions. Systems work, how we influence local, state, and national systems for change, and then in the middle of the coordination function. So as I said, we have an ambassador group um, that's really about breaking down barriers and helping us to, well, I guess they, they kind of shake up our thinking, they're disruptors. Um, a leadership group of local stakeholders from all sectors, and then the Hive team that, that manage the work. I'll skim through that, I won't explain that in great detail. What we've ended up with in our five-year strategy <coughs> is this theory of change, which we will articulate in a more visual, visually appealing way at some point. But basically, said the Hive network draws on three key methods, strengths-based community work, co-design and collective impact, to facilitate collaboration between all stakeholders, children themselves, their families, the broader community, service providers, government, business, and philanthropy. Using a basic innovation model that I, I said before, and working at different levels, suburb, postcode, and systems. Um, to try and achieve our five-year goal that all children in 2779 start school well. In terms of working with that collection of issues, what we ended up with was, I guess, a set of tools and processes that are quite different to how, how things typically work in the, the social and community sector. So then as an organisation, United Way was really interested in saying, okay, so how do we take from that and start to do things differently ourselves and how do we take that as an organisation and advocate for change with government um, but also with you know, sort of multi-sector <laughs> audience. So these are sort of three key things that the learning from the Hive has contributed to our strategic <coughs> direction statement for the next five years as an organisation. Um, we're using the Hive as a really a bit of a call it with like a, a lab, a test site for, for different methods and tools um, that we can use. And we've started to do consulting work that's based on the, the tools and methods that we've developed. Very quickly, um, one of the things that we've learned in trying to do this work, it's taken us two years to get to the point where we, we've set everything up really well. We've got lot, you know, all our groups are established. We have a five year strategy. We have concrete work plan for 2017. We've got a budget to match it. It took two years to get to that place. So, really, we've said our collective impact work as an organisation. Um, it's going to be a pretty small part of what we do. That's the kind of high end, high intensive intensive and highly resourced part of the work. We'll take lessons from working in that way from <coughs> that multi-sectoral work and do some sort of lower level community collaborations that are probably not quite so formal, not quite so broad. Uh, we might tackle narrow pieces of work. And down the bottom, as a general thing, our organisation supports communities to thrive. And that might be by a very simple and more traditional programmatic work. The theory of change that United Way has developed as an organisation, drawing in part on the Hive amongst other things, 
is that as an organisation we look at postcodes and entrenched disadvantage across the country and try to identify opportunities to work in them. What we do is you know, understanding local issues, making sure we start by talking to community members, um, mobilising resources, so again, looking at how we can bring different funders and different supporters in, um, acting collaboratively and influencing systems. Um, importantly, all the stakeholders that we work with there and our impact, obviously, the improved health and wellbeing in, in different areas of the work. In terms of consulting, I guess what we've tried to do is take out pieces of the, the work in Mount Druitt and, and offer them to other organisations. I guess there's a benefit for us in terms of raising revenue. You know, if we can apply some of our tools and, and charge for them, that will enable us to do more of our own work. But I think more importantly, what we're trying to do is get a foothold into other organisations and other communities so that we can influence them. So really it's about trying to share knowledge, methods, tools um, with, you know, with a, a broader set of people. Um, broadly what we're doing, community conversations, so based in, on the work in Mount Druitt and a method called the Harwood, from the Harwood Institute called Community Conversations, always starting by going and talking to community first and understanding them in a deep way, developing strategies based on those conversations, um, turning that into sort of lower end or high end you know, collaboration collective impact and then doing community impact assessment that's partly about quantifying the change that we're making but really more importantly learning from what we're doing so that we can continuously improve each individual project in its own individual setting. And that's it. Mm -hmm.